Hello everybody, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I thought um, that I would show quite a lot of images because I've been quite busy recently and uh, it was quite difficult to sort of condense it down into 15 minutes. So I'm, 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 I'm going to sort of meander a bit, but I will keep it to that time. So I'll show images that I won't necessarily say much about, but feel free to ask questions afterwards. And the images aren't all of sort of map or even specifically map related works, but they all are part of the sort of bigger picture that ends, that, that contributes to me making map works. Um, this is a piece that I made about um, 10 years ago, and it's made of rubber inner tubes, which is a, a material that I've used for many, many years, um, and uh, in different forms, but um, because it's sort of, I feel like a, as a sculptor, um, I have a sort of vocabulary of materials, and the things that I learn how to use and work with. And so this is, this is one of my materials that I'm very sort of familiar with. And so I was able to really quickly decide to make this particular piece with this material. It's called Rhino, and it's a map of Africa. And it was, I was thinking about rhino, um, rhinos, and it kind of looks like rhino skin. Um, and so it seemed like the, the right material. It was part of a whole series of map works that used materials that related either historically or through trade or um, either historic trade or contemporary trade to that particular place. Um, but this is, these are the earlier works that I made with rubber inner tubes, which you can see are quite different. But they were very influenced by research that I did where I actually read about the history of rubber and the Rubber Tappers Union in Brazil, uh, where rubber trees originally come from and sort of trace their history. And that contributed a lot to the work that I made. These are quite large pieces. This is about 15 foot high. <clears throat> they're all sort of sewn and stitched together and woven. And this piece, I'm, this work, it was a part of a show that I made in 1988, a long time ago, but I saw that little map on the right-hand side of Brazil, and that was, I think, the first map work that I ever made. So although I haven't consistently made map works, they, it goes back a long way. And it was really about the research I was doing about Brazil and the rainforest. And in 1988, there was a guy called uh, Chico Mendes who was, had been assassinated um, by the local logging companies. He was, like, he was sort of what I think of the first eco-warrior who put the Brazilian rainforest on the map. And he lived deep in the heart of the rain, deep in the sort of dry rainforest near Bolivia. And he realized that the rainforest was being destroyed very quickly. So he taught himself to read and he went to Washington and sort of campaigned really for saving the, the Brazilian rainforest. And he became quite well known and he went all over the world doing that. But because the that, that was um, not, you know, the, the, the local sort of loggers didn't really like it, so they killed him. But what happened is because he was so popular, um, it made international news, made big international news. And in a way, he, was, he became this sort of hero that was very, that's quite well known. Um, and he put the rainforest on the map, really, I suppose. So that's partly why we're so aware of it now, due to, to him. So I went on a pilgrimage to see where he came from and also to look into how they tap rubber trees in the rainforest, which is very different to, uh, this is deforestation, but um, th which is very different to um, how it's done in, in plantations in the east. Um, uh, basically, they cut, they cut the tree like this and then the latex runs out. But because the trees grow a mile apart, apart they have to go out and sort of collect, cut them in the morning, collect it in the evening. It's quite dangerous work because the rainforest is dangerous. So. Um, that's why, actually, a long time ago, in something like 1790, the, the, the trees were bought, the, the rubber tree was bought through Kew Gardens where it was harvested so it could be grown in plantations en masse because actually it's a very important material to our industrial, um, the way we live, you know, to our period. Um, we use it, we, we would not really be able to use electricity in the way we do without rubber. We use it for tyres, transportation, aeroplanes. You couldn't actually land an aeroplane without latex tyres. So it's a very, you know, we use it to keep us dry. We use it for contraception. It's a very important material in our industrialised society. And so I think that's kind of what led me to use it and to keep using it ever since. Um, and I think that approach to materials and making is very important to me. And um, although the work take di takes different forms, I think essentially it comes from the material 
It comes from what the material is about, what its inherent qualities are. And when I was working with the rubber, a very, I learned something. When I was researching Chico Mendes, um, a very important kind of lesson as an artist for me was that I was making maps that were very illustrative of his life and, and the sort of politics of that, but they weren't really very interesting. They were sort of drawn maps and maps with text on them. And I realised that when I worked much more intuitively with the inherent sort of nature of a material and did what it does naturally and researched it and read about it, it the work was actually much more interesting and worked on different levels. So I think that's something that I've kind of, I realised then a long time ago and have stuck with ever since really in the work. And it's quite important. This is um, actually a map of China made of uh, out of um, calligraphy rice paper, the paper that people learn to, to write calligraphy characters on. Um, I was invited to go to China in 2005 to do a residency, and I made a number of works, including this piece. Um, the big piece that I made, again, very material-based, was made out of two and a half, three and a half tons of recycled cardboard boxes that I, I bought from the local recycling company. Um, and I realised as soon as I got to China, what I was really fascinated by was the fact that people on, I'll quickly jump ahead actually, on bicycles um, and mopeds just went everywhere with these massive stacks of stuff on the back. And because they collect it, they collect material that can be recycled, whether these are plastic bottles, but, you know, cardboard, anything and everything, they collect it and then gather it and then sell it on to the local recycling company and earn a living that way. And that's really quite important to that whole um, sort of the ecology of recycling in China. And also, when, you threw your, when I threw my rubbish out, I knew it would be gone through in great depth by at least six neighbours. So, you know, because everything is reused and reused. And I was fascinated by the fact that in the West, we see China as this terrible polluter, and yet the, the ordinary people are incredibly good at recycling. Um, so anyway, out of my cardboard boxes, I made this stack, which is called Paper Card Paper. And it had lots of colour in it. And there, were lots, there was lots of beautiful colour and calligraphy on the side of the boxes that I sort of bought out in the piece. It became the Chinese artist I was working with thought it was a sort of um, a, a Western painting. Um, and um, it had great phrases on like this. Uh, but I, I was really fascinated by that, um, that sort of concept of recycling. And at the end of the exhibition, I sold it all back to the local recycle company. So, which is something that always happens where when I make big installations out of whatever recycled material that I borrow it or I buy it and then I sell it back or give it back at the end and it goes back into the recycling chain and that's very important. 